Hey everyone, good evening. This is Amy Kathleen Lee. I'm with Dancing with Ed, and I am live from Phoenix, Arizona to have a Share My Story interview with a dancer, Joey Chan. She's coming to us from Hong Kong. I'm very excited to that you get a chance to meet her. Um, just a minute, if you don't know about Share My Story, it is a project I created um, about a year ago when I realized that sharing our stories and experiences is what builds community and it helps us feel connected. So dancers, teachers, anyone with experience with recovery who say, you know what, I want to I want to share what I've been through so that I can inspire other people um, or this is what someone's story did for me. So tonight we're going to meet Joey Chan. Um, she's a very special person to me. I learned a lot from her story. She told me how much it's already helped her being part of this process. So let's go ahead and meet Joey. There she is. Hi, Joey. Can you hear me okay, honey? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing all the way over there on the other side of the world? I'm doing great. It's been two years since I'm back home, so it's exciting to be back. <laughs> yeah, so you are... Um, I met you through just being on the Instagram with Dancing with Ed. And yeah. your account, um, you are not only a dancer who has recovered from her eating disorder or in the process of recovery, but you became a registered dietitian to work uh, with dancers. So um, I'm really excited for you to share how, how you went from being in, in the uh, studio and, and going through some of these experiences to the other side where you're helping dancers and you're being the person you needed back then, which I think is so inspiring. It's all about how did they get there and how can I do that? All right, yeah. so we're, gonna, we, we're not gonna share too many intimate details because I know with eating disorders, they can be a little triggering. So mm -hmm. for emotional safety, we're gonna make sure that we kind of keep the details minimum, um, focus on just the main themes um, I think that in itself is just so uh, helpful for everyone. Um, so let's see. We know how we met. It was through Dancing with Ed. Um, let's see. Tell us about, like, when you started dancing. Where were you living? Yeah. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. So I started dancing in Hong Kong. Okay. And I started dancing when I was four. I started with Chinese traditional dance. And then eventually... Uh, when I get into grade 11, I started contemporary as well, and then eventually got into street dance when I got into university, and that's, like, all the dances that I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, yeah. I, was, I just glanced down at my paper, and I was thinking, you know, I never asked you, why mm -hmm. is it that you decided to do this before, before we step back in? Yeah. Why is it that you decided to say, you know what, I'm going to share the intimate details of my recovery live? Yeah, I guess um, having been through the journey uh, of eating disorder and being in the dance scene where a lot of emphasis on body, uh, size, shape, and weight has impacted on my growth and my mindset on myself, and I feel that it's important for us to speak up also um, in order to let this dancing change in the future. And if I'm able to share and if anybody resonates and if I can advocate for this community and that's what I would like to do. Yeah. Well, that's inspiring. It reminds me that we can be the difference that we want to see in the dance yeah. community. So if we want to see people, are oh, there still people joining? I'm waving at everyone. If we want to see dancers talking, we want to hear, you know, hear people addressing the stigma. Let's start right now by yeah. doing that. Right? Yeah. So yeah. you were in, you were in Hong Kong, you were really little. Um, you've done a lot of different types of dance. Um, what was it 
what was it like for you as a young dancer? Um, when I was, when I just started dancing, mm -hmm. I was, I was not born with the talent, I don't think. And I was not the best in class. I was not the teacher's favorite. And I always feel like, mm, there's something lacking. And I'm like, um, I'm always like at the back of the studio and I didn't mm -hmm. want to show much. <laughs> like I'm scared. And also mm -hmm. I have pretty low self-esteem. But also on the other side, I would like to prove myself. I would like to show the teacher, okay, I can do it. I want to be in the center. And yeah, I have that. I'm quite competitive <laughs> as per se. Yeah. So, so you fit me. right in with ballet then. A lot of people, uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of ballet dancers are competitive. I've heard. Yeah, true. And that's also a very similar um, mentality in Chinese dance because we also have like a lead dancer in the center, in the middle, and then all the others are like mm. group dancers. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so did you, um, did the other dancers talk about body image, their bodies? Did they talk about food? Was that something that was going on around you? Or is that something that you heard somewhere else? Yeah, I guess there's multiple messages around me when I was growing up. First of all is uh, like the I was in the community where all the dancers around me are discussing about food and weight mm -hmm. and how we want to go on different diets. And that's kind of like a normal conversation for us mm -hmm. uh, back then. Yeah. And also, like, our dance teacher always would give comments about our weight and sizes for example after a long holiday for example chinese new year we would definitely have had a really great holiday with families and friends and with celebrations and food and then after that the teacher would immediately go on and say once we get back into the studio mm -hmm. they will comment like oh you guys you guys need to work harder work harder oh, wow. Yeah. What kind of message was that sending? Yeah, I felt like, okay, that's what she was telling me was, um, I need to dance more. I need to lose that weight in order mm -hmm. to be able to have a better dance performance. And that's what mm -hmm. the message was sent to me. Yeah. So instead of taking the opportunity to uh, nurture your relationship with your body as young dancers, um, they were actually uh, teaching you how to be critical of it in some yeah. ways. Maybe they just, maybe they do that with themselves. Yeah, yeah, and they I just, would, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that they, because they grew up in that mentality as well, and they were taught by their teacher, for example, mm -hmm. with that, same idea so that's how they see that their students would need to be in that mm -hmm. perfect shape in order to be a good dancer and that's how i yeah my teachers right. yeah. when you said you said that you had you know so you're you're young um we all know at that age we're pretty impressionable um we we kind of absorb what other people are saying about us we compare ourselves to a lot of people um, especially, you know, the other dancers. Um, and so here you are kind of in this environment that's, that might be a little bit toxic. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I don't know, you know, there's a lot of different ways to cope with that. What, how did, how did you cope with that? Um, there's, I guess, when I was younger, I was just absorbing everything that either my parents or my teachers or friends around mm -hmm. me were saying. And then when we were discussing about dieting and stuff, I wasn't sure whether they do it specifically, but because I'm so obsessed with my mm -hmm. own um, weight and size and I couldn't emotionally deal with all the frustrations and mm -hmm. the um, disappointment and my self doubt at that time mm -hmm. so i turned that i turned my attention into controlling my food 
and mm -hmm. wait. And that's how I cope with those feelings and emotions when I was young, right. I guess. Yeah. Right. And that's all, that's very common. We see that a lot in, um, in a lot of dancers and also non-dancers. Um, mm. Because we have to, we have to do something with those feelings. They have to go somewhere. It, it's sort of a, we, you know, it's a natural instinct to survive, to continue yeah. going, even where, when we're in a bad environment. So as a young dancer, you know, you, you did the best you could with what you had at the time, it sounds like. Mm. Um, and yeah. there wasn't a lot of conversation or education at the school. Um, what was your relationship with your parents? What was that like? I guess um, I was mostly, uh, I was a very hardworking student <laughs> mm -hmm. growing up and my parents were not pushy, but then they didn't have much time hanging out with me. So I was basically, I was focusing a lot of my time in studying and also dancing. And that's where I derived my attention into. So yeah, that's how. Mm -hmm. And there's also some uh, frustrations and issues between me and my parents, of course. And I also couldn't deal with those emotionally at that moment because I was too young and I didn't know how to. And then eventually I turned yeah. my into food again. <laughs> again, turn it to food. Yeah. And now, so looking, looking back on it, was there anyone that you that you would have trusted, like if you, if you knew then what you know now, who do you think you would have reached out to? Who would you most likely have talked to? A friend, like a dance friend, or a dance teacher, or maybe somebody not involved in dance? Um, I guess if I knew something that I don't know now, I would definitely go to someone who had the experience, who were a dancer or is a dancer and who has recovered, who's gone through the journey so that I knew that there's someone out there who has experienced something similar to myself. And mm -hmm. if she has um, get support and she would be able to provide uh, ideas or support for me to see how I could support mm -hmm. myself through this way right and i really need that like kind of anchor Get but having anchor. Said, i think if uh i mean my mom was a very big anchor for me during my recovery journey she's always very supportive uh with whatever i do so i'm really blessed and glad mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. like a parent figure as a very supportive figure in my uh, recovery journey yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that later in the story, you mentioned how it was your mom who helped you get the help that you needed. So you went from, let's see, you were at age 14. I think it's grade eight. So it's about eighth grade. You joined a dance team. The teacher was really harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at that time. Yeah. I think she was not giving comments specifically weight centric or like, body related however I didn't feel valued at that at, in that team at all I, I I didn't probably how she um picked up picked out like other students for um solos or triplets performances which I didn't get any chance during those four or five years in that dance team because normally we would rotate and we would all have our chances when we get into like older grades but then i i didn't feel value at the mo at that point of time and then she always pushed us too much and we were like bruises everywhere and hurt ourselves and even though with that we would need to perform our best because the prize is what mm -hmm the teacher was telling us you need to mm. get a prize from the competition and that's what you need to do. <laughs> and, mm. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was really pressured. You're that really young to have to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. And um and then you transitioned 
Um, you went from that into dancing even more. You mentioned you went um, into university. Like, so as you got a little bit older, you started dancing more and things mm -hmm. sort of spiraled from there. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, dance wise, I guess I started to transition from Chinese dance to contemporary where it has a more welcoming environment and I was able to express myself a little bit more through contemporary dance and I also love it more and more <laughs> compared to Chinese which dance wise I guess contemporary is more kind of an outlet but at the same time because contemporary is more about emotional expressions and stuff like that through that journey I somehow discovered something that I couldn't dealt with in the past and then at that moment i also not i also don't know how to deal with those emotions when they come up again and and then in the university i i also learned i was in food and nutritional science major so i learned more about food and nutrition and mm -hmm. all the knowledge and and then also because all the knowledge we get and also the medical centers very weight centric Yes. And then, yes. yeah. And then with my internship, I learned how they teach other people to do dieting. And then mm -hmm. I got that idea and I picked it up, just picked it up and do it by myself. And that was not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. So you were studying nutrition science because mm -hmm. like, you was in, you were interested in it. It's something that you enjoyed. Um, but at the same time, you were learning things that were actually not so good for you. Yeah, exactly. Right? And because of the mindset that I have about my body and then with the, I didn't know how to cope with emotions. And when I get something that I thought, okay, it's something that I felt safe with is the mm -hmm. food and nutrition. And that's why I use that instead to cope instead of, finding other healthier way out yeah and and sometimes like yeah like when we're drowning when someone's drowning and they're just kind of grasping for anything you know we're just we'll yeah. even grasp on to the most radical the most unhealthy thing because we're we're just desperate to kind of get to get through whatever it is going on um yeah in Wait. in our daily life so <laughs> practicing that now you had mentioned that people were actually complimenting you or rewarding you um, because you were, your body was changing. And so yeah. what was, what was it like to be, um, to have your eating disorder reinforced? Yeah. So at first I was still in a contemplating stage where I didn't really want to change because people around me, um, those people not too close, uh, to me that are around me were complimenting because they see the outside, they see how my success in dieting was. And then that's how I feel like a little proud of my eating disorder at that moment. And then, and then, but people closer to me, like families and closer friends, they started to be more worried because I started to lose my period. I started to lose my hairs. I was very irritated all the time. And then I was, and inside, mentally, I was very obsessed with food, weight, and exercise. It was not healthy at all. And I couldn't focus on other thing else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is, it's, it dominates our mind mm. so that we don't have to deal, cope, feel, look at yeah, whatever the, the, the real, the thing is, you know? Um, and in yeah. the beginning, it, it feels like, oh, this is safe. You know, I can control this. I've got this plan and, and, and I can live in this little bubble here and it makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. um, but as the years go by, we realize this is not, I'm not going to live through this if I don't get rid of this. This is not mm -hmm. helping me. This is killing me. Um, yeah. and my spirit, my, you know, um, so you, you told me that you, you use these words, you had a wake up call, um, and it was pretty scary. So tell us about that. 
Yeah. And um, when I was in the university, I was one, one year I was preparing for a dance competition. However, I got sick from it uh, because my body was quite weak at that point. And with all the uh, with all the disordered eating behaviors and stuff like that, my body was quite weak. And then um, at that point, I know that I can't let my teammates down because I was one of the leaders. I need to be there. I need to go through the competition. And that's what kind of motivates me at that point. And I started to tell myself, I have to eat. I just have to eat in order to have strength, in order to have strength to go through all the practices five to six days a week, four hours every time, and I have to go through those practices. So I tell myself to eat. Whenever I'm hungry, I just eat. Mm -hmm. And then after that competition, like that kind of pushed me through that competition. And then I was glad that I was able to do it. And then after a while, I had like a very quiet, scary panic attack, which I didn't know I was having a panic attack at that point because I was during a dance rehearsal, I was uh, having difficulty breathing. I didn't know what to do. I was thinking, oh, there's probably something happening to my body or like to my heart and I was scared and I thought I would faint, but then I didn't faint. Mm -hmm. I just, I immediately slowed down and then caught my breath and then um and then i just went backstage and rest and then after resting for a bit i was feeling better and i was able to go through that performance as well but after that performance i didn't dance for a few months because mm. i was scared i didn't know if anything's wrong with my body so i didn't want to be in that similar experience again and then yeah that was the kind of wake up call at that moment okay yeah that's something i, I figured that out you you yeah. got are you still with me honey yeah you you um you got super sick with a fever do you remember that you mm. had a fever really really bad was that the same time and your friends started to to say stuff to you like do you need help or am I thinking of a different time? Uh, ye it was after the fever. Yeah, that was after that was after yeah. you had. Yeah, because you had gotten really sick physically um, mm. as well. But you just kept going even when you were sick. Yeah, I when I had the fever, it was during the competition. Oh, OK. Uh, during my preparation for the competition and mm -hmm. I was sick for a week and I couldn't dance. I was just able to stand at the side and watch and give comments. And that's all I can do. I couldn't mm -hmm. dance because physically I just couldn't. And then right. that's why I told myself I need to be able to dance, like stand back up on my feet or else I just have two weeks more. And that's mm -hmm. what pushed me. Yeah. Well, and to, to say pushed you, you know, when we initially talked about this and you told me your story, you said, I don't know what pushed me you, at the, you were just yeah. like, what is, what is pushing me? And, and you said the fact that I didn't want to die like that. That's yeah. That is intense yeah. that you, so basically you just forced yourself. You're like, I don't, this is not going to be it. This is not going to be it for me. I'm going to keep going. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. brave. Yeah. I, I just feel like I don't, I don't want to end like this i want to live i want to dance i want to be happy and healthy mm -hmm. and i want to be able to enjoy life and yeah that's how i got through yeah and i think we i don't know if we're going to cover it or we or we'll do it now it's just that idea that it sounds like or do you feel like being a dancer and having everything inside of you as a dancer was that did that contribute to your ability to push through and to save yourself actually i think yes because as a dancer we always 
push ourselves through limitations and mm-hmm. we always to get out of our comfort zones challenge ourselves and strive for the better and that's how we improve and i think this mentality actually could help us to get through actually helped me uh get through the recovery journey because once i turned my um strength and motivation and determination into getting better and i would actually do it because that's how i need to improve and get better and that's like similar mentality as being a dancer yeah absolutely it's weird cuz that's the same thing that happened to me i was just i just I had been sick for so long, like 20 years, and I was like, "F this. I'm sick of this." And I was just I took all my stubborn, determined, like goal-oriented perfectionist and was like, "I'm just going to turn it and go away from the eating disorder instead of journey towards it." And it's like, you can't stop a dancer from recovering when they decide yeah. to recover. They yeah, are literally absolutely. on fire and unstoppable. Yes, that's us. <laughs> that is us. Absolutely. Um you had you did finally um see someone and you were your your mom had helped you to get connected because you you were having the health problems, you had some some panic attacks which you weren't even sure what they were. So how did you get hooked up with some medical care and, and what came from all of that? Yeah. I uh, at first I just reached out to a family doctor for some blood tests and for like a chat cuz I told him what happened and then all the tests came out negative and they were all fine. I did several tests in a few months. And then after that because a, a few panic attacks was happening at home when I was alone as well and then i was like i need to do to check my heart and then i did mm-hmm. which was very important as well for um eating disorders and yeah. then and then the doctor did an ecg on me and that mm-hmm. was fine <laughs> and then and then the doctor told me the doctor were aware that i lost a lot of weight but then he didn't do any psychological assessment or anything mm-hmm. like that regardless a, a diagnosis or anything and he didn't refer me to any um eating disorder specific professionals he just told me you can't lose more weight you need to start eating and then i told him okay i'm eating already um and then he said yeah so don't don't control your eating anymore and there you go you can leave and you're okay and that's wow. how he left me and at that point i was like i I was still a little bit um frustrated and like I'm confused. I don't know because physically I felt there's something, but then the doctor told me that I that there's nothing wrong and I was like, okay, then hmm. I have to I guess I'll have to believe there's nothing wrong. And then um yeah, at first was that and then my mom actually was the one who initiated me to uh told me to see a psychologist she suggested me okay cuz there's nothing wrong with you physically would you like to chat um with a psychologist and see if she, if anything that could help you with and then i was like okay i remember i was like crying at the time as well <laughs> like okay i'll try <laughs> cuz there's nothing else i know <laughs> that could help mm-hmm. and then after that the psychologist actually uh gives some strategies really helpful strategies for me to cope with the panic attacks and then also that belief in myself not being sick is also very important and strong mindset and that's what the psychologist taught me because if i always think that i'm sick then i will never recover and if i believe that i can recover and i believe that i'm not sick then i'll i'll recover and that's yeah. the very strong mindset that i've learned <laughs> yeah that's an that's such a good 
uh, skill, a tool to use in any situation, you know, where we flip things around. Um, and when we go about our day and we're finding ourselves, you know, feeling those feelings again, you know, we, we, we bring in those tools that we learn from the people that are there to help us. It's unfortunate that the doctor basically said, just stop. Mm. Just, you know, just eat. We've <laughs> all heard that one before. Yeah. Right. That doesn't work. You don't just stop having yeah. um, a, <laughs> an eating disorder. It's much, disorder. it's much more complex. So I'm really glad that mom uh, was able to kind of say, you know, let's look at the, not just the physical body. Let's look at the mind. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and it sounds like you really benefited from that. And you also um, are a person who writes a lot you like to reflect yeah um, in your life has that has that helped you in your recovery as well yeah absolutely I think the whole recovery process is about self-discovery and and also reflecting on um, old behaviors and then what's worked what doesn't and finding ways to cope and like learning from experiences where I fell and I have to stand back up again. And that's the whole purpose of the recovery journey because we're always learning and learning and discovering ourselves through this recovery journey. And I think reflection really helps me. And reading back on the journals that I've written throughout the years, and I think sometimes it's a really good um, uh, reminder, reminder for myself, because when I'm going through like other hardships, not only um, about eating or food and weight and stuff like that, I would, I thought because at that moment of time, you would always think that, oh, that's the worst moment because you are experiencing at that point. But when you look back at what you've written, that's how I saw the similar me back then. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that back then I was actually feeling the same and I was actually okay that I got through. I, I'm on the other side. So that's kind of give me strength and told me and reminder for some of the skills that I've used as well to go through that hardship and then tell me that, okay, this is only um, happening now and I can definitely go to the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that you can um, almost come back around to share space with your old self and, mm. and see her from yeah. through a new lens yeah. and, and yeah. see the growth, the growth, uh, the perspective shift uh, yeah. and that, that you've had. Um, you're still you, you're her uh, in yeah. the future. So each time you're like, even now, tomorrow, something might come up and you're just like, I just, I can't do this or whatever it is you tell yourself. You can look back to today and say, but yesterday, that's what I felt like. And I got through it. I did it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you, um, you mentioned control. And I think uh, a lot of our audience would be able to relate to that the the sense of um, controlling food and eating disorders sort of or go hand in hand. So I, I want to ask you, how did the need to be in control fuel your eating disorder? Mm, I guess growing up because there's a lot of confusion and like there's a lot of frustration around me and hearing different messages. And because as I said, I didn't know how to cope. I need to drag on something to feel anchored and feel safe. And that's how I developed this sense of like controlling things. For example, even with study, I felt like this uh, mentality to be able to control would uh, allow me to feel safe in where I am and what I'm doing. And that's kind of fill my eating disorder because that kind of push me towards eating disorder more because mm. controlling food and body helps me feel safe yeah right 
So the, using the coping skills that you you learn from the psychologist you were working with, your mom was supportive at the time. Um, did, do you have any friends that you talked to about what you were going through? Or was it something uh, that you just kind of kept between you and your family? Um, I guess I didn't openly talk through with my friends, but they were aware of what I was doing. However, we, because we weren't taught about eating disorder, like I only got an idea of having an eating disorder when I get into master's study, when I was studying for my dietetics study, it was not well talked about in the society in Hong Kong. And it, it was kind of like a stigma because it's a mental mm -hmm. illness and we were not talked a lot. And um, my friends were aware of what I'm doing. We were only, I was only talking about my behaviors, but then they didn't know how serious it was at the moment, like mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then a lot of the unpacking and untangling was afterwards, like after I've got through all the behaviors. And then I, I reflect back when I was studying my master and I was like okay at that time I was going through this and that's probably it and yeah that's all the unpacking was done after so that's you're you so you were studying it and you were in it as a as your education so you're talking about food and so you're what was it like kind of doing both still learning about nutrition and having that as the topic but not using the disordered eating to cope like was that was that really hard for you or did it once you shifted it it was it was done like does that make sense yeah it does make sense yeah yeah, yeah. um i won't say that when it shifted it was done it was not that <laughs> okay. i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was definitely that easy because basically you're having three meals a day you're talking about yes. food every you're learning about food every day and that's like constant bombarding about food and nutrition and then that was like a roller coaster ride i would say like sometimes i felt better sometimes i was open um i was able to get a hold of the eating disorder and get past it and then sometimes the disorder eating behaviors came back or like maybe not the behavior itself sometimes it's the thoughts came back and it depends on how how I was coping and how mentally strong at the moment. And it's like roller coaster. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. And then throughout the journey, I felt like I and there's also a, like friends around me studying together. They also had similar issues and they had um, disordered eating behaviors, and some of them was diagnosed as well. And they were kind of like um, live models for me. Like mm -hmm. that's how I see when when they were able to recover, when they were doing their own reflection and when they shared their stories. And I was like, probably there's something I could do. Probably um, I could try that. And then that's how like kind of motivates me as well. Yeah, the the dietetic students around me kind of motivates mm -hmm. me as well. And also. One thing is that I've mentioned the medical field is very weight centric. And of course, we were taught about how we should weigh uh, our patients because for some diseases or some scenarios, we need that. We need that as information. And then, um, how, and of course, eating disorders, sometimes we need the weight as well because we need to keep them safe. But then uh, on the other hand, there's, more and more evidence is surrounding like healthy at every size and like non-diet approach where I've started to gain more and more interest in that area through studying. And also I felt like those um, ideas resonates with me, my core values more. Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of, it turned me to pursue what I'm doing now that I would like to work with um, eating disorders, uh, and also help with disordered behaviors and how to 
help people to heal their relationship with food. And also, like, I would like to advocate for the dance scene and see if it can be changed or, like, it's less focused on weight and allowing more diversity in the scene. Yes. Yeah. And so what were, when you were a dancer, what were some of the, the triggers for you when you were in the dance environment? What was the most triggering thing for you? Uh, first of all is the mirror, <laughs> looking at the mirror. Because mm -hmm. in the mirror, I can see myself, I can see my body very well, and I mm -hmm. could always compare, comparison, compare myself to my peers. And also the very tight leotards. That is a trigger. And um, because it shows how your body shape inside really well, it's just outline your body. And also with right. the teacher saying, commenting on our body shape. And yeah, that was also another trigger. Yeah. So are you an advocate for using less mirrors in the studio? I would say, I would say yes. I'm not sure whether it's using less mirror or like, give dancers the opportunity to learn and dance without mirrors. Like sometimes mm -hmm. after we learn, like at first, maybe at first when we were learning the routines, we need to like look at the, the angle, the form, and then right. learn about those basics, physical stuff. However, when we are performing we won't have a mirror in front of us like we are on stage we're facing the audience so mm -hmm. at the end of the day you you can't face a mirror to dance and if you are only copying from the mirror you're not you're not in tuned with your body and you can't feel a lot with your body and what's like even with that angle like form wise you're doing something right but you're not feeling it then it doesn't, it won't resonate or it doesn't, it won't express the dance well and the audience won't get it, then there's, it's not the point of the dance, I guess. Yes. Yeah. It's, we're not meant to be dancing with mirrors, right? And mm. in, te in a way, we can start dancing with the mirror um, and, and in it. And instead of in our body, instead of being in our body, dancing in our body with our body, we're, we're stuck in the mirror. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a great analogy for, for those of you who are listening about for recovery, you know, being stuck in our head or stuck in being back in our body, um, being in the mirror or being in our body. Um, you know, body image is education is crucial, I think, to, to a very a well-balanced dance education. We need much, much more of that. They spend a lot of time on technique, which is, I'm old school classical ballet. So I love that technique, but we also have to teach those coping skills. We have to have those conversations about how are we feeling about, you know, our, our changes that we're going through and how do we cope with those? Um, if you think about what better place to have a body conversation Mm -hmm. Then in dance, when you're moving your body, yeah, it exactly. kind of makes it, it kind of makes sense to me if you think about it. Yeah. So, what do you think we can do to decrease stigma and increase awareness? Hmm. I guess first of all, with uh, I can't say for everyone, but for myself, because I have my lift experience. Mm -hmm. And I would do something similar as what I'm doing now. I would like to share what I've gone through so that if someone can resonate and find peace and find it helpful and support through this, then I'm really grateful that I could provide that. And also being a prof health professional, I would like to work in this field and provide support that I, that I would love to have when I was younger, when I was going through the journey. 
and then also keep speaking up and advocating for this community and I guess um, being not afraid of the stigma myself would help to reduce the stigma in a bigger picture because we can only do our do something by ourselves and if we are doing our own in things individually and then eventually it will be a bigger power <laughs> sorry right. it spreads yeah. uh, you know hope hope is contagious and it is mm, it, yeah. uh, it will have an effect on on the people around us when we change our conversations so what would you say if we have somebody listening right now that was struggling with something similar to yours what would you say to that person yeah um i guess first of all is to don't give up because recovery is a long journey and at times you would you might feel like it's never going to end but when you think about the small steps you've been through for example the you just follow one of the accounts that you find helpful that is supportive of body diversity or like you reach out to one medical professional even if they turned you down that is one step that you go ahead to recovery and then so with those little steps and little steps building up, it's rough and it's not an easy task to do at all. However, you have to know that you will recover if you want to. And then with those little steps, you are learning in progress. And in progress is my life motto. And I always remind myself that I'm always in progress because I'm learning through experiences mm -hmm. and, and we, are, we are always learning and through mistakes. So even if we make mistakes, that's a, that, that doesn't define us and that doesn't mean that um, we're going to lose it or anything. It just means that we have a better chance to recovering because we know that doesn't work. Yeah, so don't give up on yourself. <laughs> And also another thing is to reach out to someone that you trust and then um, just talk about it. Even if it's not a medical professional, you might find some comfort through even friends or like the conversation or the fact that you talk about it is very um, powerful. Yeah, it is. Just speaking it out loud we feel less alone and yeah. eating disorders are isolating and diseases that um, keep us hidden, you know, and we don't want to talk about it. But the moment we say, Hey, you know what, this is what's, this is what I've been feeling. This is what I've been going through. And, and, a, and a good supportive person won't try to give you advice. They won't try to fix it. They'll just say, man, you know, I'm, thank you for telling me. Thank you for, for trusting me to, for opening up. You know, I'm really sorry that you've been, been struggling. Um, and it sounds a lot like recovery mimics learning to dance, right? Mm, you, yeah. to do the choreography, you kind of like there's right steps, but you learn it by doing it wrong in some way. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just like dance. Yes, yes, you're learning the you're learning the steps, you're learning how to to um, have a different relationship with food. But it's not perfect. And we don't do perfect recovery. There's no such thing as perfect recovery. Mm. Or perfect dancer. Right? No. We are all we are all human. And that is what's so beautiful, I think, is that in our brokenness and in our humanness, we can be all alike. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your message to dancers. Um, what have you learned about yourself, your recovery through this interview process? Yeah, thank you again for this opportunity to allow me to 
walk through the journey from the beginning again. And it was actually my first time sharing my journey from the very beginning. You are so point. brave. You are so brave. Oh. If everybody's listening, give her a round of applause. Everybody clap. Yay. Everybody clap. <laughs> I, I can hear them clapping for you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and being able to walk through it again, I actually got like new, um, new ideas on what I've been through and kind of have a new lens on looking back at my eating disorder and I and I would thank the past me and I would thank the eating disorder that's taught me through all the life journey that I've gone through and also yeah and I'm and I'm glad that I've done this interview so it has given me a chance to reflect and learn <laughs> And it is all about the process of learning and growing and figuring things out. And just like the little Joey who was writing in those journals a long time ago and didn't know if it was going to you know, ever be okay, you can look back and say, yes, it's going to be okay. It is okay. And, yeah. and we, can, we, we watch each other do the same thing. Be like, yeah, it's, it's going to be okay. It might not feel like it. It might feel impossible. But in recovery, that's where things are possible. Yes. That's where freedom is. It's the only place where it can be found. So if mm. anyone, you know, anyone listening, if you're just like, gosh, you know what, this really resonated with me. I connected with this and I, 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 I want to find uh, a, either a better resource or I, I don't have any resources. I want you to, as soon as we log off, I want you to message me, direct message me, direct message Joey. And we are waiting to have a conversation with you. I would put a, a, a number on the, on the screen. I would, you know, chat about a whole bunch of different things, but you know what? I'd rather talk to you. So if you're connecting mm -hmm. with me, if you're hearing what we're saying, send me a message, send Joey a message. We're waiting to hear from you. How did this interview impact you? If this inspired you and you're like, wow, you know what? I want to do that. I think that's something that would be good for me. Send me a message. I would love to talk with you about how it works. It's very simple uh, process of sharing your story. Joey, let's um, wrap up with how do they contact you? Not just through Instagram. Do you have a website? Um, I'm sorry to you... say I don't have a website at the moment. Okay, but I, so Instagram yeah, so, is yeah. the best place? Yeah, either Instagram with this Instagram handle, Dance Nutrition Hong Kong Food Freedom, mm -hmm. or you can email me uh, with joeyc.dietitian at gmail.com, which mm -hmm. is also on my Instagram page. And feel free to follow my Instagram for Cantonese content because that's what I'm putting out at the moment. And then, yeah, I hope to see or like hear from you and talk to you personally so we can connect. And feel free to message me and don't afraid to reach out. I'm here to be a listener and companion. And yeah. All right, this video will be up on our YouTube channel and on our IGTV. Share it with anyone that you think would benefit. Thank you again for watching. And Thank you, we'll talk to you soon. For Thanks, me. Joey. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.